Um, I'm Hernan Bass. Uh, I'm from Miami originally. I uh, still live here, uh, 31 years old. And I make paintings and other stuff. <laughs> For me, I've always had a pension for the supernatural and sort of the weird or off-putting parts of like society or whatever. Initially, I kind of tied those themes of, of being not natural and, and sort of off the beaten path with sort of homosexuality at the same time, sort of mixing them together in a way where um, one of my first shows at uh, like first solo shows was called It's Supernatural, like pun on words, like it's super natural. You know? <laughs> The way I dealt with adolescence in, in terms of coming out and growing up and homosexuality, I kind of always termed that period fag limbo, like it's my little term I used to like calling it. And it's sort of this, this weird twilight moment between realizing that you're different and the point where you tell everybody else that you're different. I, I, that's that sort of limbo phase. And I think that's kind of where all my figures early on, they all kind of live there for a long time. <laughs> I kind of made work that I hope that sort of relished that moment in a way. It was sort of celebrating it, and I think there's a real charm to sort of the act of closeting in a way. Um, I know that sounds weird, but there's a sort of aesthetic and, and these sort of clever things that kids do to sort of hide that. And um, I always go back to this, this sort of metaphor of um, like someone you know, hiding a Madonna record in like an ACDC sleeve, you know? <laughs> there's something weird there that, just, that hasn't really been talked about that much, and I, I think those early works were sort of trying to, to figure that out in a way. I think with anybody who's sort of dealing with themes of you know, homosexuality and stuff, you sort of have to go through his phase and in a way kind of get over doing that kind of work in a way. <laughs> Not that it's a bad thing to make work about homosexuality in any way, but it's, it's something I think I need to grow up alongside the work. And I think with any subculture, you know, gay, black, anything, it's, it's always oof, these weird baby steps that kind of make you cringe when you're in that group, you know? <laughs> but kind of have to happen sometimes, unfortunately, just to get general acceptance, I don't know. You know, I think you just have to each do your own little part, and whatever that part adds, adds up to something bigger, hopefully. You know? I'm not exactly marching in the streets, but I'm hoping my little bit can inspire someone that does, you know? So I don't know if that makes any sense. It sort of hasn't really dawned on me still to this day. I think the moment I walked up the night of the opening, and, and you know, the museum's pretty dramatic with the lights and everything at nighttime, so that kind of hit me for the first time, but it still kind of doesn't even feel real in a way. Um, I know it's up there, but I don't even like calling it a retrospective. Like, they're calling it a survey, which is much easier for me to handle, you know? <laughs> like, I'm a little too young for a retrospective, you know? Plus, it's also weird because it's not really the show I necessarily would have put together. It's, it's also about the Mali relationship to the collector and, and to the rebel's eye and how they look at my work. And I think it shouldn't be ignored that it's, that it's a coming from one source and one person's or one family's sort of taste in someone's work in a way. <laughs> I flipped through my own archive and the show I would have put together would have probably been a little different, but I don't know. I think it's interesting to see how people react to your work and especially a collector who's known you for like close to 10 years, you know? <laughs> it's, it's weird to see what they were drawn to over that course of those 10 years too. It's like, what does that say about them? You know? <laughs> Ocean Symphony came from this weird notion of faith in things, and it's basically based on pure faith. And so the, for me, the, the Ocean Symphony piece was about laying at least one of these sort of myths to rest. Like I wanted to make this sort of funerary moment for the myth of the mermaid. So the, these shells have these sort of horns and they're playing the sound of the ocean and sort of almost like an Egyptian rite of passage, like making all these offerings to the mermaid. And so on one end you have these beautiful, the cliche mermaid on the video, and that's the idealized, beautiful version of the mermaid. And then in the centerpiece is the sort of P.T. Barnum freak show mermaid that was popular in like turn of the century and people actually believed was real. And it's kind of amazing that the want to believe in something can be so strong that even when presented with this hideous little thing that's like half monkey, half fish, they're like, mermaids exist, you know? <laughs> 
It's amazing how many people have come up to me and asked me to this day, like, is it real? Like, which I find still proves my point completely. You know? <laughs> like, I don't want to say, you're an idiot, but like, wow, let me talk to you some more. <laughs> The Estate story came from uh, Huisman's book Against Nature, and his character in the book is like the ultimate decadent. And he decides to decorate this tortoise in loads of jewels and gems and just for the sake of beauty. And of course the tortoise dies, because so <laughs> you can't do that to a tortoise. Um, so for me, I wanted to make the tortoise sort of a martyr for the age of decadence and sort of treat him as this sort of saint to that whole you know, aesthetic and the whole movement. So. I kind of just wanted to put him in his place and honor him, you know? <laughs> as silly as that sounds, but I think I deal with these um, avant-garde and sort of outside of the, the norm uh, situations, but I tend to treat them in a pop sensibility sometimes. So taking something that's sort of um, not well liked and translating it into something that can be palatable to like a general public, you know? Yeah, it's like the Flintstones vitamins, you know? <laughs> Like, I grew up with Flintstone vitamins, like, and I don't know, I don't know if my work is, is actually as a Flintstone vitamin, but, <laughs> but maybe it is, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think the one thing would be that if people walk up to the work and look at it and say, like, okay, he's a, he's, he reads a lot and he's busy when, in his head, you know? <laughs> that kind of happens a lot with my work. It's, it's, it's sort of like a one Google search leads to another or something. <laughs> and I do Google a lot, but like, um, the decadence I try and explore is, is not necessarily always going to be the most opulent. It's, it's sort of an eccentric decadence. You can be like really poor and be extremely decadent at the same time, you know? I think. You know. My dad has recordings of when I was like three years old, like saying, I want to be a painter. And like my kindergarten teacher, like supposedly says she kept all my drawings because it might be worth money one day or something. I don't think I really had any other interests really.